All right, it is my slide. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Max Constraguet and I am second year particle physics graduate student. It's my student pleasure, it's my pleasure to welcome you today in our first talk in our new series of machine learning and particle physics seminars. We will be back every Thursday of the term in the Zoom room at the same time, 3 p.m. The talks are going to be recorded and shared on our YouTube channel. I'm going to share the link in the conversation a bit later. Uh, today, we welcome Dr. Ricardo Vinuesa, who is an associate, professor at the, uh, an associate professor at the Department of Engineering Mechanics at KTH Stockholm. He is also a researcher at the AI Sustainability Center in Stockholm and vice director of the KTH Digitalization Platform. He received his first PhD, he received his PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering from the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. Among his many achievements, he has notably received the Goran Gustafsson Award for Young Researchers. One of his many interests uh, lies in combining numerical simulations and data-driven methods to understand and model complex wall-bonded turbulent flows. This is, going, this is going to be the main topic of his talk today, titled Artificial Intelligence, Computational Fluid Dynamics and Sustainability. Thank you for joining us, Ricardo, and the uh, virtual floor is yours. I just I would just like to remind everyone to turn off the microphone except talking uh, during the seminar. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for inviting me uh, to give this seminar. It's really a pleasure for me. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, I am at KTH in Stockholm uh, at the Department of Engineering Mechanics, and I also work within CERC, the Swedish eScience Research Center. So in today's talk, I'm going to uh, address two uh, aspects. <clears throat> the first one is uh, how can we use uh, artificial intelligence uh, for sustainability? That will be a short introduction uh, and that will motivate some of the computational fluid dynamics, CFD uh, problems on the second part of the, of the presentation. So for the first part, uh, we asked ourselves the question of uh, is, if there is any published evidence of whether AI can uh, act as an enabler or an inhibitor of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And to do this, we had to assemble a quite complete multidisciplinary team uh, spanning a very wide range of knowledge areas uh, to be able to assess the literature and to have a meaningful discussion to, to do this. Uh, this uh, has been published last year, uh, actually now almost two years ago, in Nature Communications, so you can see the reference here. And you can actually see all the details of this study. I'm just going to highlight some of the main uh, results uh, in this talk. You can have a look at the team, which spans a very wide range of uh, researchers, uh, experts in applied AI, fundamental AI, uh, social interaction, uh, ethics, uh, economy, biodiversity, and also uh, sustainability and energy systems. So you can really see the very uh, broad uh, range of areas that we that we cover, which of course matches the range of areas in the 17 SDGs. And the first thing that we did was to divide the, three, the 17 SDGs into three main areas, having to do with the society, with the economy, and with the environment. This is a quite a standard classification, so that we can actually make the analysis a bit more broadly uh, in, in, within these three areas that we have identified. So generally, our results uh, indicate that we have uh, AI, based on published evidence, has mostly a positive effect on, on the SDGs. 79% of the targets of the United Nations can be positively affected by AI, whereas 35% can uh, have a negative influence eh, as a consequence of the AI. Perhaps the environment is the area with the largest positive potential, uh, whereas uh, one can maybe argue that the society uh, is the one which has the, the most negative potential, uh, although this can be maybe understood a bit in more detail if we go to each of the, of the SDGs. So what we can see on the left is uh, for each of the SDGs, what is the percentage of targets that is positively affected by the development of AI, <clears throat> and on the right, the percentage of targets from each of the SDGs that receives a negative influence uh, as a consequence of the development of AI. And uh, what we can actually see here, uh, I mean, we can focus on the light lines over here, uh, but what we can actually do is to analyze the strength of the evidence uh, of the references used to make these relations, these positive and these negative relations. And to do that, we classified all the references that we found into four different categories. Uh, so the A uh, type of references were the ones based on the most uh, reproducible and robust methods, uh, which have a weighting factor of one, going all the way down to the D type of references with a weighting factor of 0.25, 
uh, which are the more speculative and perhaps less uh, easy to generalize uh, references. And the, if we go back to this result, to this slide, uh, the thicker lines are the ones uh, obtained by taking into account the weighting factors. <clears throat> so we can see that, of course, the thicker lines are smaller or equal than the thin ones, right? And uh, what we can actually see by comparing the thin and the thick ones is how strong is the evidence for positive and negative effects of AI. And what we can actually see is that the positive effects of AI on the environment and the society are quite robust because both the thin and thick lines are very close to each other. Uh, however, when one looks at the uh, economy, we can actually see a quite big decrease. Uh, when we look at the thicker lines, this suggests that there is a big uh, knowledge gap uh, when it comes to the positive effects of AI on the economy. And therefore, those uh, positive effects are perhaps more based on speculative uh, work that uh, really highlights uh, an important area of, um, of research there. Now, some examples could include the uh, SDG1 on no poverty, where there has been some work on uh, analysis, analysis of satellite data with convolutional networks to track and assess areas of poverty, uh, negative effects on SDG 10, eh, on uh, increasing inequalities. <clears throat> of course, if the future is going to heavily rely on AI uh, and not everybody has the same access to this technology, then we're going to you know, exacerbate existing inequalities. And uh, some more negative effects can be associated with the polarization and increase of uh, bias uh, election outcomes and, and things that we have been observing uh, maybe more pronounced now in the context of, of Corona. Uh, so what we argue is that uh, uh, regulatory oversight uh, should be preceded by regulatory insight. So we should have experts and people who know what they're doing, uh, who are part of, this, um, of these committees that are regulating and that are uh, supervising the deployment of these AI uh, technologies from a legal framework. Uh, another example has to do with the COVID uh, contact tracing apps, where we actually developed a, a socio-technical framework uh, to really assess whether uh, the data management and the deployment of these apps were compliant with uh, technical solutions, but also with regulatory bodies. You can actually see the results in this, um, in this article, in results in engineering. And uh, maybe the summary of this, uh, of this talk uh, can be put into these three uh, agents, the technology, the individuals, and the government, where the developments of the technology are very fast, the individuals are lagging behind, and the governments certainly are much slower when it comes to their, um, to their regulations. Everything happens uh, in the context uh, of the environment, uh, where we are also having, of course, in this cycle, uh, an important impact. And uh, in this uh, figure, the thickness of the arrows indicates the speed of change. <clears throat> so, of course, the changes in technology are much faster than the reaction speed of the governments uh, with respect to that technology. <clears throat> and uh, one area that I want to focus on is SDG 11 on, on sustainable cities. Uh, we want to highlight that uh, 800,000 people uh, die in Europe every year because of exposure to high pollution levels. And uh, AI can really help in the context of developing more uh, robust ways of measuring the pollution in cities and coming up with more uh, effective strategies to, to, mitigate, to mitigate this. And this is one of the areas where we can actually connect with uh, the physical uh, interpretation and the, and the fluid mechanics of these urban environments, which will be the second part of the talk. Uh, you can see here a, a very detailed simulation of the flow around a, an obstacle, a building. And uh, what we want to do is to use sparse measurements uh, to be able to reproduce the three-dimensional flow fields, which also include the pollution concentration and the temperature uh, by uh, neural networks and by deep learning. Uh, and we can do this uh, in different ways, but uh, essentially we can uh, use uh, either convolutional networks to be able to uh, to reproduce the planes uh, of, the, of the flow above uh, the, the measurement location. We can also use here, I'm listing uh, recurrent neural networks, but also transformers or other methods to be able to reconstruct the temporal dynamics. You can actually see here the level of detail that we have in these simulations, where we actually reconstruct all the important flow structures in these in this environments. And one more aspect that is important, is the interpretability of the deep learning models. <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, deep learning models are essentially black boxes. Um, but uh, despite the number of uh, explainability methods that one can understand, one can develop, uh, more classical methods, uh, in a recent article in uh, Nature Machine Intelligence, we highlight the importance of um, 
of really developing the uh, interpretable deep learning models when applied in applications, when really deployed in medical applications or in decision making. And there is a way to, to try to do this in deep learning models. Uh, for example, the approach by Kramer and others uh, with uh, inductive biases and, and, and basically genetic programming in order to develop a symbolic expressions that can generalize quite well. So now we're getting more into the more technical part of the talk, uh, how we can actually uh, leverage all the knowledge that we have uh, from the from the AI possibilities into sustainability and how we can apply that to concrete applications. And to do this, we're going to do <clears throat> non-intrusive sensing. Uh, here I'm, I'm mostly using convolutional neural networks, but we're also going to show results with GANs uh, at the end of the talk. <clears throat> so essentially what we want to do is this problem where we have the building and the flow, and we use the information at the wall to predict what happens above the, above the wall. And there has been quite some literature in this. Uh, there have been a number of linear uh, studies dealing with linear methods, uh, for example, linear stochastic estimation. Uh, in a recent work uh, in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics, we showed by using transfer functions that nonlinear prediction methods uh, are actually better to be able to do this, uh, this estimation, right? using information at the wall to predict the flow above the wall. Uh, and this is because, because turbulence is essentially nonlinear. Uh, more concretely, it has two different parts. Uh, one a scale interaction part, which is mostly linear, that's called the superpos superposition of the large scales close to the wall. And this uh, linear part can be very well reproduced by linear methods. But of course, the nonlinear interactions that are mostly due to, to modulation, that those require nonlinear methods to be properly, properly represented. And that's where the neural networks come in. <clears throat> and we can actually use them to, to be able to predict quite well. Uh, depending on the location that we are uh, trying to, to, to really analyze uh, the flow properties based on the wall information. So to do this study, we start with a simpler geometry than the urban environment. We consider a, an open channel. We do direct numerical simulations with the Fourier Chebyshev code um, Simpson here from, from KTH from Stockholm. Uh, we consider in this first case a low Reynolds number, a Reynolds tau of 180. And then we consider a number of properties, including the uh, open and on the upper side to be able to simplify the dynamics of the large scales uh, when we only have one wall. Interesting things. Um, one can use fully connected networks uh, for predicting flow features. The problem, of course, is that then, uh, well, in addition to the very large number of parameters, is that you don't have um, a way to exploit the spatial information that you have in the data, uh, which, of course, in the case of fluid mechanics problems, uh, it's very, very prominent. No? These spatial distributions are very important, and uh, that's what we try to exploit with convolutional neural networks, uh, which are extensively used in computer vision, of course. Uh, and in this case, uh, I guess everybody in the audience or most people in the audience are familiar with this, but essentially we use this kernel to, to be able to do the convolution operations uh, and uh, with a reduced number of parameters in the first layers, we can actually obtain very meaningful predictions. So <clears throat> schematically, what we are doing, we have this, um, this open channel. Uh, we are using the information at the blue plane, uh, that's the wall. So basically the two wall shear stress components uh, to predict the information on the yellow plane above. Uh, and we do this with convolutional neural networks that are going to be exploiting the spatial features in the data. Uh, so in this first example, we will use the two wall shear stress components to predict the streamwise velocity fluctuations above the wall. And uh, we are doing this uh, for closed loop um, control. Uh, this is one of the motivations. If we can predict the flow very well, we can use this information to actually pretty nicely uh, develop better control strategies. What we have here uh, is to uh, dis we design the convolutional neural network architecture that we're going to do. So we have two walls, two planes as the inputs, the two wall shear stress components. We have a number of hidden layers, and in this case, the output is only one plane, which is the streamwise velocity fluctuations. Uh, all the results from this part can be found in this article by Wastonia and others. Um, we use the ReLU as an activation function. Uh, you can see the, the size of the input is 128 square grid points. So that's really the, the, the amount of grid points that we're using in this low Reynolds number case. Uh, and this number indicates the number of stack layers. So the number of filters that are being applied um, in each of these layers uh, and they are stored as feature maps that are going to be used for the prediction of the next, uh, of the next layer. So in this first, um, 
in this first uh, layer, what we have is a filter that has, a, or a kernel that has a size five times five, right, and a depth of two, uh, which of course is much less in terms of number of parameters than the equivalent that you would have in a fully connected network. So this is why, uh, or one of the reasons why CNNs are quite uh, widely used in the context of uh, in the context of computer vision. And of course, when we go deeper into the network, what happens is that each of these uh, filters is uh, identifying features on the input map. Uh, in the case of turbulent flows, these features can be uh, streaky structures, regions of recirculation, regions of intense uh, fluctuation. <clears throat> and of course, uh, as we go deeper into the network, then the depth of the, of the filter needs to match the number of, lay of uh, feature maps of the previous layers. So uh, what, we have, what we also observe uh, because of the definition of convolution is that as we go deeper into the network, we can actually identify progressively larger features. <laughs> And this is interesting because turbulence has a hierarchical um, structure in the sense that uh, smaller uh, structures uh, are able to make up larger features that are uh, observed farther away from the wall. And therefore, this uh, hierarchical way of learning of the convolutional networks is very uh, nicely suited to the way in which the turbulent scales in turbulence are actually um, taking place. So these deeper, these networks towards the end of the, of the output are identifying larger features from the, from the input mat, and they're able to predict the, the larger scales that we have in the output. Now, <clears throat> Uh, we can use CNNs in different ways. Of course, if we want to have a global output, uh, which could be a classification problem, and we have this image and we want to label it as a car, then we will have a fully connected uh, layer at the end. Uh, in our case, we don't want to have a um, fully connected layer at the end. We want to have a local output. So we want to see for each of the points of the input, what will be the point of the output. And uh, with this, we have a fully, conv uh, fully convolutional network. So towards the end, we still do convolutions. We need to adjust the size of the input to that of the output. And there is some padding because of the periodicity of the domain. But essentially, <clears throat> the size of the output uh, has the same size of the image that we want to predict. And uh, that's why we use fully convolutional networks, which give me this local output that I'm actually interested in. <clears throat> what I'm showing here is actually the characteristics of, uh, of the flow, eh, of this uh, turbulent flow. So you can actually see these streaky structures eh, that are very, very typical of turbulence. Uh, the first line, the first row is the linear result. Eh, that's the linear stochastic estimation. The second one is the reference. And the third one is the neural network, so the nonlinear prediction. This uh, is the streamwise velocity fluctuation at y plus 15. <clears throat> so that's uh, the near wall peak of fluctuations. That's the region of a strong turbulence intensity. <clears throat> and uh, what we want to match is the second row. What you can see is that the neural network uh, agrees quite well with the reference. Whereas the linear method uh, attenuates significantly the, the, the intensity of the fluctuations and also uh, it smoothens the, the characteristics of the streaks uh, in a way that you can see that the, the, the nonlinearities are not so well reproduced. So <clears throat> this is actually interesting. Again, these results can be observed in more detail in this reference over here. It's interesting because you can actually uh, see how, uh, as expected, we can uh, outperform the linear methods quite significantly by using uh, CNNs which can account for the nonlinearities of the, of the flow. <clears throat> this also happens if we go farther away from the wall uh, at y plus 30. And this plane is still close to the wall, but um, probably uh, you can actually see that this is more in the buffer layer. So you can actually see some uh, different features of the turbulence. Uh, you can see the reference in the second line. And uh, still the neural network reproduces pretty well the nonlinear patterns that are present in this, in this flow. Uh, whereas the linear uh, field, uh, the linear prediction uh, is much more attenuated and you can actually see uh, that, the, that the streaks are very, very smooth here. So this is, this is quite interesting because you can, of course, when you are farther away from the wall, the fields are less correlated. So the predictions are more difficult. Uh, there is a still a linear footprint, which is what the linear stochastic estimation is reproducing, but uh, the neural network is able to significantly outperform the, the, the performance of this uh, linear method. And of course, at y plus 50, which is farther, farther away from the wall, the neural network starts to uh, predict worse, but uh, it maintains the structure of the, of the field and uh, the level of the fluctuations. You can see that the linear method is basically not predicting anything which is a quite uh, uh, interesting result because if you want to target large scales, 
uh, to do control or to be able to analyze how they are correlated with the wall, uh, then you certainly need nonlinear methods and deep learning in this case is really helping us. So this is uh, what we can uh, see when it comes to uh, the predictions. Uh, there is actually an effect of the time step between the snapshots, uh, because of course, if you are uh, looking very close to the wall, then the time scales of the, of the structures are very short. So a very small delta T will allow me to see many different structures. But if you keep the same delta T farther away from the wall, when the scales are larger and slower, then uh, the information will be much more redundant. So you won't be able to actually see so much data. And in this particular case, at Y plus 50, having larger delta T improves the, um, improves the predictions and reduces overfitting. So uh, one has to be aware of the, of the uh, importance of choosing the right uh, delta T. Uh, so you can actually uh, get the right scales when you're using the training data for your predictions. And this is when it comes to turbulence statistics. Uh, on the mean, we have the mean flow. And on the right, we have the stream-wise velocity fluctuations. Uh, you can actually see in orange, the small delta T, in blue, a larger delta T, and in green, the linear method. And uh, I mean, close to the world, we get errors uh, smaller than 3%, which is very nice. And we actually, uh, the, the linear method goes from 12 to actually 45% uh, error uh, when we go farther away from the wall. So in all the cases, the, 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 the neural network-based uh, approaches are outperforming the linear classical methods for this. Now, uh, what I have shown you so far is at a low Reynolds number, a friction Reynolds number of 180, which is turbulent, but it doesn't really exhibit a significant separation of scales. <clears throat> what I will show now is at Reynolds of 550, which is a, a, a more, let's say, uh, reasonable to Reynolds number. It's a higher Reynolds number where we can actually understand much better the features of the separation of scales and the effects of a, a more turbulent uh, flow at a more realistic condition. Now, in this case, we consider three input fields, which are the two wall shear stress components and the wall pressure. Um, and then, uh, so instead of two inputs, we actually have three. You can actually see the fields over here. And as an output, I have the uh, three velocity fluctuations in the three directions, the stream-wise, wall normal, and span-wise velocity fluctuations. <clears throat> These results uh, can be found in a recent uh, article in JFM. So you have the reference here. This is Guastoni and others who uh, extended the previous work to, to this one. <clears throat> so you can actually get a quite nice uh, description of all the deep learning tools and also the, the the features of the of the flow that we are trying to predict. As mentioned before, we use periodic padding, which is uh, used because uh, the flows are periodic, eh, and we can actually exploit the deterministic uh, capabilities of the CNN prediction. Now, in addition to the, so the, the method that I have been showing so far, this is the, what we call the FCN method, the fully convolutional network. I have one plane as an input, I predict the whole play of a plane as an output, and that's it. Uh, however, there is another method that we have also developed, uh, and you can see in the same article in JFM, but also in Wemes and others in Physics of Fluids, you can see a bit more of how this method was developed. Uh, this is what we call the FCM POD. So in this case, what we do is that uh, we uh, conduct a proper orthogonal decomposition, and the, the POD, which you can see here. That means that the, uh, the U vector containing the three velocity fluctuations uh, is decomposed into spatial modes and temporal coefficients. And then in this sense, what we need to do is to predict those temporal coefficients instead of predicting the whole signal. Uh, we actually do it in a tessellated domain. So we divide the domain into different, into smaller squares, thus for uh, making the predictions easier, uh, because uh, for each of these squares, any uh, scale larger than the domain uh, gets lumped into the zero mode. So this is more practical from the prediction point of view. Uh, in, in, to summarize, what we do is that we do the POD of the flow, uh, we have the spatial modes, and then it's what we need to predict is this temporal coefficients over here. So uh, this has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. Once the model is trained, it's about its evaluation. So the evaluation is reasonably uh, straightforward and reasonably fast. But it's important to keep in mind that in some uh, regions of the domain, one method is going to perform better than the other one. 
So what I'm showing here is the streamwise velocity fluctuations uh, at Y plus 15, that's the first uh, column. This is again the near wall peak, so the region of strong fluctuations. And in the second column, I'm showing the results at Y plus 100, which is in the outer region. <clears throat> this is, a, as I mentioned, a Reynolds Tau 550, which already has separation of scales. So we actually have this outer region uh, where we can uh, identify larger scales. Now, <clears throat> The third row is the DNS, the direct numerical simulation. This is the reference, okay? The reference that we're trying to match. The first row is the extended POD. And the extended POD is a linear prediction method that is formally equivalent to the linear stochastic estimation. <clears throat> so essentially, this is the linear method. <clears throat> the second row is the FCM POD. So we will use the network to predict the POD coefficients. <clears throat> and the last row is the FCN. So that's the case where we are just doing the, the convolutional network to make the prediction. What is interesting, first of all, is that the linear method, uh, of course, is uh, exhibits attenuated fluctuations. Okay? So uh, as before, if we compare the first and the third column and the third rows, uh, the linear method is not performing so well because it can only capture the linear uh, interactions of the flow and not particularly the, the superposition of the large scales into the wall. Um, the fourth row, which is the FCN, you see that it has an excellent agreement at Y plus 15. So close to the wall, when I'm predicting close to the wall, doing the full convolutional network to make the predictions, it gives me excellent results. And uh, interestingly, uh, this I will show you in a minute the error levels. Interestingly, this is more efficient than doing the POD, than doing the proper orthogonal decomposition and then predicting the coefficients. If we compare the second and the third row, what we see is that farther away from the wall, all the predictions degrade because the output is uh, less correlated with the input. But in the case of the FCM, FCM POD, we get a better agreement than just with the FCM. Now, why is that? Well, one could argue that in the case of the FCM POD, what you are doing is that you are first encapsulating part of the, spat or the spatial information into these spatial modes first, and then you don't need to predict the whole signal. You only need to predict the temporal coefficients. You only need to predict part of the information. Uh, when you have a small scales close to the wall, uh, the range of scales that are present there and the energy containing it is, this is really uh, not so easy to encapsulate in a few POD modes. They are not dominant uh, large structures that are taking up all the energy. But farther away from the wall, you have dominance of these larger scales, and it is in principle possible <coughs> to uh, do in POD to encapsulate a significant fraction of the energy into these large scales. And then it's more efficient computationally to just predict the temporal evolution of those large scales than having to really, really uh, look at the full prediction of the plane with the FCN of the large and the smaller scales and the detached eddies and all the mess that happens over there. So, message. <clears throat> Close to the wall, the most efficient approach is the FCM. Far away from the wall, the most efficient is the FCM POD. Okay. And if we look now at the statistics, what we see uh, is uh, these three figures, the stringwise, wall normal, and spanwise velocity fluctuations. Uh, the black line is the reference uh, of the DNS. <clears throat> the orange triangle is the fully convolutional network, the FCN method. The blue dot is the FCM POD, <clears throat> and the green uh, square is the extended POD. So what we see is that um, close to the wall, the orange triangles, the, the FCN, performs extremely well. I mean, the string was velocity fluctuations has less than 1% error close to the wall when using the FCM method. Um, when, of course, the, the both FCN approaches perform better than the extended POD in other locations. Um, except uh, perhaps in the wall normal uh, case where the three of them are performing in a similar way. But what is interesting is this crossover, right? When I'm going to the farthest away location, the FCM POD has better performance than the FCN. Uh, the error that we obtain with the FCM POD very far away from the wall is a bit more than 25%, which still is quite um, uh, remarkable given the difficulty of these predictions. And this is something that would allow us to really do control of these large scales uh, with a real-time prediction based on all world information. So FCM POD performs very well far away from the wall, which is a quite interesting and remarkable result for us. 
Uh, something that I also want to comment on is the possibility of improving the training performance. So this is something that we, uh, this is a transfer learning, essentially, right? So what we, we do two examples of transfer learning, and I guess many people in this audience is familiar with transfer learning, essentially is to uh, transfer the weights of one model to another one in order to exploit the knowledge that has already been uh, learned in, in, a one, 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 in the first configuration. And what we're doing here, is that we have a, a network trained to uh, make predictions at y plus 15. And then uh, for predictions at y plus 50, so far the wall, away from the wall, we freeze the three first layers. So we, we transfer the network from 15 to 50. We freeze these three first layers and we only train the three last layers. Now, what is the, uh, in, the intention of doing this? <clears throat> When we go farther away from the wall, we will have larger and smaller scales. And in principle, since the first layers are uh, identifying and predicting smaller scales, those ones probably will not change so much. So the smaller scales are probably quite similar, eh? close and farther away from the wall, whereas the larger scales uh, change. And those are the ones that we can actually identify with the last layers that we, we train after the transfer level. So the results, which you can see here, show us that we can obtain the same level of accuracy with the transfer learning uh, at a one fourth of the computational cost. Uh, in this case, we measure the, the GPU time used to train the model. Uh, so essentially we can reduce by a, more than a factor of four the training time and the required by, by the GPU model in order to make these predictions. So we are uh, effectively exploiting the information that we know from the small scales when we are actually trying to predict farther away from the wall, uh, benefiting from some of the most interesting features of the tool. Another example of transfer learning, which is also quite promising, is uh, going from low to high Reynolds numbers. This is an example that I like very much. So, and this is again also shown in the JFM paper, Journal of Fluid Mechanics. So you can actually see the full reference here. <clears throat> what we do, uh, and for the ones who are not familiar with uh, direct numerical simulations, um, this uh, simulation at Arita 550 is significantly more expensive than the one at 180. I mean, we're talking of orders of magnitude more expensive because of the, how the Reynolds number, uh, the cost of the simulation scales with the Reynolds number. So what we do here is that we train a network to make predictions at 180, and then we do transfer learning. So we initialize the network for the high Reynolds number predictions with the weights of the 180. And then what we compare is the loss function as a function of the, of the batches of the training uh, of the, the network for 550, considering 100% of the, of the training data set, 100% of the training data set with transfer learning, 50% and 25%. 25% would be this uh, brown line that you see over here. So what we can actually see with these results is that the case where we transfer the weights and we use 25% of the data set has error levels that are very similar to the ones uh, that we obtained originally without any transfer learning. In other words, we can obtain the same results with 25% of the data, uh, which is actually quite remarkable, right? Because the simulation at 180, at low Reynolds number, is very cheap. So you can run and obtain millions of, uh, of um, instantaneous fields to do this training. And by doing transfer learning, we can reduce by a factor of four the amount of data that is needed at high Reynolds numbers. So we can reduce significantly the computational cost of the high Reynolds number training data set while preserving the, um, the performance and the quality of our predictions. So I, think, I would say that this is a quite interesting application that, of course, we are now exploring in the context of other um, of transferring among geometries and also among different turbulent configurations, which seems to, to work quite, uh, quite well. So this is the potential of transfer learning that we are observing. And uh, another uh, technique, which I believe is uh, interesting, is what happens when the information at the wall is sparse, right? <clears throat> so uh, the first example that I showed you for the building was when in the ground, we had only a few sensors, right? 
and we try to predict from those sensors the flow. Uh, however, many of the examples that I have been uh, showing you, uh, we are considering the whole information on the wall. We are not considering only a few measurements, but a whole the whole plane as the, as the input. In reality, that's not the case. You don't have access to such detailed input information. You only have few sensors for that input. What we did here was to use uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs, which as you can see here schematically, uh, this uh, architecture has two parts, a generator and a discriminator. The generator is producing high resolution images based on low resolution ones. And these images are uh, respecting the statistical properties of the reference data set. And the discriminator has to uh, differentiate which high resolution image is true and which high resolution image has been produced by the generator. Uh, in a way, I mean, these two parts of the network, they are trained together using game theory in a way that both get better at their jobs, right? The discriminator gets better at differentiating which images are fake and the generator gets better at producing realistic uh, high resolution images. So using this approach, what we did was to create a network which has two steps, as you can see here. The first part of the network takes the three inputs, so the two wall shear stress fields and the wall pressure. Uh, with significant downsampling, so you can actually see very coarse fields here, <clears throat> and obtains a high resolution version of those fields, right, using the GAN. Uh, and in the same network, there is a second step, which uses this high resolution inputs to produce predictions of high resolution of the three velocity fluctuations away from the wall. So we are using low resolution data from the wall to produce high resolution predictions away from the wall. Now, what is interesting about this, uh, and I can show you here this result, this, this uh, uh, work, by the way, is published in the Phys in Physics of Fluids. Uh, this is a paper from last year by Wemes and others. So if you want uh, more details of this, you can just uh, go to this article, but uh, you, you can actually see something quite interesting. So here I'm showing you the instantaneous wall shear stress. At the, so this is wall information. And this is the DNS. This is the reference uh, data. Uh, the first row shows results after downsampling, so by a factor of four, by a factor of eight, and by a factor of 16 in each direction. So you can actually see how the input data gets coarser and coarser. Eh? And this one over here with FD16 resembles the few sensors that I was showing before for the urban data case. Eh? So the, this, this one over here is the few sensors. And you can see that in this case, the input does not really resemble much the, the original data. I mean, this has been so double sample 16 uh, times in each of the two directions. So this is really, really a very coarse uh, input field. <clears throat> and on the second row, what we have is the prediction uh, of the network, uh, of the GANs part of the network <clears throat> of the world shear stress field based on this input. And you can actually see <clears throat> that both at four and eight, the agreement with the reference is uh, significant. We actually get very good agreement, but even at 16, which of course uh, exhibits uh, some attenuation, uh, the fluctuations with FD16 are much uh, weaker than the ones that we see in the reference, but you can actually see something interesting and is that the uh, locations of these uh, streaky extractors. You know, in turbulence, you have uh, elongated extractors, which are called streaks close to the wall. And these elongated extractors their location is respected and their sizes uh, are also respected. So this uh, architecture from this very, very, very coarse input that you can see here is able to obtain quite, uh, quite good predictions of the reference flow at this, uh, at this location. And when we are doing uh, flow control, for example, uh, the idea is that, um, I mean, we want to have the information from the wall to predict what happens above the wall. And knowing this information, I want to set up the control. Uh, what happens is that uh, I don't necessarily need to have an, a perfect prediction of the flow here. Most likely, what I want is just uh, an idea of where the large scales, the energetic scales are, uh, so that I can try to suppress those in a robust flow control uh, approach. So what happens is that uh, the flow that I'm predicting with the GANs approach, it is, um, I mean, it's not exactly correct, but it is physical. It is physical and it gives me the information that is interesting that I will require in order for a closed loop control strategy. 
So this is actually a quite remarkable approach. Uh, and I think that uh, this is quite beneficial uh, in the context of uh, future studies for non-intrusive sensing. Now, if we, we are actually running these uh, models uh, in the context of urban environments, so we are managing to get very good predictions of the urban, of the urban flows, uh, but this has really the potential of um, obtaining very robust predictions in urban environments. And uh, so some future applications on which we are working, we are using, um, uh, we have shown the feasibility of using a neural networks to predict turbulent shear flows, both in the context of spatial information. I have also some publications where we have uh, done this for the temporal dynamics. So we can actually predict pretty well the temporal dynamics of these complex uh, turbulent flow cases. Uh, but there is uh, quite some work on developing machine learning based boundary conditions for um, turbulent simulations, uh, generation of inflow conditions <coughs> in order to obtain a computationally efficient, especially developing simulations, uh, time tracking of turbulent extractors. This is something that we're working on to be able to learn the temporal dynamics of these turbulent extractors uh, via machine learning. And we are also uh, trying to use this for flow control. So we are using the non-intrusive sensing and the flow control uh, approaches based on deep learning. And uh, we're using uh, autoencoders for model reaction. This is another uh, area that we are being quite active. So we are uh, able to use uh, with autoencoders non-linear model decompositions. So classical methods are linear superpositions of the modes. Um, the non-linear approach, uh, the advantage of this is that we can, uh, in a way, uh, exploit the possibility of having much fewer modes, so we can have a more compact reduce of the model while retaining some of the interpretability and the orthogonality of the modes that we have been obtaining for this model decomposition. So there are many directions within fluid mechanics and in particular computational fluid dynamics where we can benefit from machine learning and, and, and in particular deep learning uh, also in the context of optimization and uh, a speed up of some of these uh, computational fluid dynamics applications. So to conclude, I have first shown that uh, based on our uh, work, uh, AI can help to achieve 79% of the SDG targets, uh, but it can be an inhibitor for uh, 35%. So it's a very much needed global debate to be able to harness all the, all the positive potential of AI. CNNs are um, very useful tools for reconstructing turbulent fields and predicting turbulent fields. Uh, we actually have obtained excellent predictions, especially close to the wall. So when we want to control the near wall region, we have uh, obtained less than 1% error uh, in the turbulent fluctuation fields, uh, which that means that we can obtain significantly better results than with linear uh, reconstruction methods. And uh, we are looking at some improvements like taking into account the structure inclination, uh, refining the transfer learning strategies. And also we are looking at more complicated architectures like uh, transformers, both for the temporal, but also for the spatial predictions of these uh, interesting flow cases. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you have my contact information here, my email, my the web of my group, and also my social media information. So I'm always happy to discuss if you have any questions uh, or possible collaborations, and I will be very happy to address your questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for this very interesting talk. Um, I guess we all are joining into uh, giving you a round of uh, virtual applause at the moment. Um, if anyone has a question, please uh, don't hesitate to jump in. All right, otherwise I actually had one myself. So you seem to show that um, adding, uh, using information at intermediate layers helps you predict and train the network to predict at a further layer, uh, further away from the, the initial plane. Have you considered using a recurrent uh, neural network using the CNN as its goal to try to model um, it planes at successive distance from the initial inputs? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's something that we are exploring with different approaches. Um, so uh, what I have shown here is always from the wall to the location. So either close or far away from the wall. But we are now trying to use architecture so we can get intermediate predictions that can help improve the, the, the prediction that I have ultimately far away from the wall. So that's, uh, I mean, with a recurrent uh, approach that can be a very nice method. And we are uh, exploring different alternatives in order to do it. Because of course, the, the challenging prediction is the far away from the wall plane based on this uh, on this input information. So if you can get intermediate planes, you can hopefully uh, improve the performance of that prediction. But that's currently under investigation. That's very interesting. And also connected to this, 
are probably trying to, to revert the direction. So when you've predicted something at a certain distance, try to predict back the, the input to see if, it, if there's closure. So that's, um, that's a good question. That's something that we have tried in another study. Um, it works, it would not actually work so well, or it, it, you can predict the, the wall information based on information far away from the wall, but there are two things that are different. One is the, of course, the size of the receptive field, um, you know, far away from the wall, you have very large scales and you're trying to predict something very small. Uh, when you predict something small from the wall and build towards something big, uh, you are exploiting the hierarchical learning of the network. So in that sense, it's uh, easier to make that prediction. To do it the other way around is a bit more difficult because you try to predict something big based on something small. Uh, we are playing also with, uh, uh, with uh, normalization of the inputs and uh, you know, like trying to really uh, re reorganize the figure so we, or segmentation of the figure so you can get some of those features with a smaller receptive field. But there is, so that's a data management uh, aspect. But I would say that there is an Another physical aspect, and is that uh, the wall receives all the uh, information from the um, from the large scales. There is a causality there, uh, so the wall contains that information as an input. But the other way around is not necessarily true. The larger scales far away from the wall do not contain as much information from what happens at the wall. So there is some lack of information there uh, for that prediction, uh, but it is uh, something interesting. I mean, we are trying to, for example, for developing boundary conditions and things like that, we are looking at doing that reverse prediction, uh, but so far it's not as, uh, let's say the results are not as good as with the direct prediction. Thank you very much for your explanation. Uh, so if anyone has a question, please do jump in. Otherwise, I think we can thank our speaker again. And, uh, thank you very thank much, you very much uh, for, for inviting me today. This was really a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to, to have this discussion with you. Yeah, same. Pleasure to discover about fluid mechanics. Well, uh, have a good day, everyone, and uh, thanks again. Goodbye. Thank you.